As a result of Caesar's theatrical display of the Marian trophies and images during his aedileship, a resurgence in the populist movement erupted in Rome. Lucius Sergius Catalina, allied with Antonius Hybrida, who was the brother of the Antonius Creticus who had bungled the conquest of Crete, announced their candidacy for the 63 BC consulship amidst whispers of debt cancellation. The poor, who stood to immediately benefit from a general cancellation of debt, threw their support behind Catalina and Antonius. The conservative Senate, which had dominated Roman politics almost unchallenged since the death of Sulla, and holders of most outstanding debts, stood to lose much more than merely an election. They could see the handwriting on the wall. The older conservatives were still tainted by Sulla's reign of terror, and the younger generation had not yet reached an age to qualify for high office. A power vacuum existed, which would be dominated by the reformers if the conservatives could not fill it with a candidate strong enough to defeat them. In desperation, the conservatives turned to Marcus Tullius Cicero. For the conservative party, Cicero was a gamble. Despite the fact that Cicero had acquired a reputation as an able administrator, stood against corruption and bribery, and was considered a constitutionalist, he was still not from Rome. Having been born in Arpinum, the same town that gave them Gaius Marius, Cicero's status as a new man meant that, to the conservatives, he was still considered an outsider. Although they were not sure that Cicero, once consul, would continue to uphold the prerogatives of the Senate, they favoured Cicero's stability and belief that only by defending Rome's constitutional laws could a repeat of the civil war be avoided. Lacking a better option, the conservatives threw their weight behind Marcus Tullius Cicero by discreetly spreading bribe money amongst their combined clientele. For his part, Cicero could no more finance an extravagant consular campaign than he could when he was aedile. And so, as his political strategy, Cicero employed the age-old tradition of mudslinging. Cicero brutalized Catalina by accusing him of intentionally stealing from non-Romans during the dictatorship of Sulla. Cicero also reminded voters that his opponents had all been complicit in Sulla's dictatorship, while he had not only kept his hands clean, but had exposed Sulla's dictatorial corruption. He also accused both Catalina and Antonius of being allies with Julius Caesar, who had not only polarized the nation with his publicity stunt, but was, himself, running for the praetorship. In addition to his defamation campaign, Cicero fought hard for the support of the wealthy equites, who stood to lose the most if the reformers succeeded in passing a cancellation of debts. With the support of the wealthy businessmen and conservative senate, and by tainting the reputations of the other candidates, Cicero won the 63 BC consular election in a landslide victory. Antonius Hybrida who, to the majority of voters, was less extreme of a reformist than Catalina, came in second in the polls, to serve as co-consul. Highly upset with his placement in third, Catalina immediately began campaigning for the 62 BC consulship. Upon assuming office in January of 63 BC, Cicero did something completely unexpected. So that he might take control of the government for the entire year, without interference from Antonius, who was known to be associated with the reformers, Cicero offered to trade provinces with Antonius, in exchange for his slipping quietly into the background. Lots for proconsular governorships were drawn in advance and the proconsular province drawn for the senior consul for 63 BC was the province of Macedonia. Because of the extreme wealth to be made by governors there, Macedonia was the most sought-after province. Antonius Hybrida jumped at the opportunity to so enrich himself, and then politely stepped aside in favour of Cicero's agenda. The first major problem to confront Cicero's consulship, unfortunately, was the issue of land reform. Despite the civil war, social war, Mithridatic wars, slave uprisings, and decades of bloody politics, land reform still topped the list of reformist objectives. Cicero, himself, had no interest in tackling an issue which, in his opinion, was a destabilizing factor for Rome. But, because a bill was brought up by one of the new tribunes of the plebs, Cicero could not avoid it. This legislation was a modified version of the land reform bill written by the tribune Marcus Livius Drusus before the social war. The bill outlined a land commission, made up of ten members whose duty was to buy land, and redistribute it to Rome's poor, via a lottery system. In order to fund this bill, 
The commission would be given the authority to sell parts of the Ager Publicus, or state-owned land in Italy, as well as outlying provinces. Although he could not prove it, Cicero believed Caesar to be behind the writing of this legislation, and so opposed the bill. In order to turn public opinion away from the land reform bill, Cicero rekindled old fears deeply ingrained in the Roman psyche. In 451 BC, following the long struggle between the patricians and the plebeians, a commission of ten men, called the Decemviri, were elected to create the Twelve Tables, a set of laws outlining procedural rights for all Roman citizens. While writing these tables, which took several years, the Decemvers simultaneously used the time to abuse their positions of authority. When such abuse, by a Decemvir named Appius Claudius, led to the abduction and rape of a noble plebeian girl named Virginia, most of the Decemviri went into exile, with Appius Claudius committing suicide while in prison. The Decemviri were now known as the Ten Kings by the Roman conscience, and by comparing these ten land commissioners to the abuses of Rome's Ten Kings, Cicero's opposition to the land reform legislation was successful. The Senate voted it down with very little backlash from the public. But, his opposition to the land reform legislation saw Cicero immediately pegged by the reformists as a staunch conservative. When Cicero chose to defend a conservative senator in a major trial which had arisen, he cemented his conservative label in the eyes of the reformists. A man by the name of Gaius Rabirius was accused of being involved in the murder of Tribune of the Plebs, Lucius Apollius Saturninus, 37 years earlier. Saturninus died, stoned to death by ceiling tiles, on the floor of the Senate House. The charge against Rabirius was brought by a tribune of the plebs named Titus Labienus, who was a patron of Caesar, and urged by Caesar to bring this charge. This was a politically motivated accusation in which Caesar was warning the Senate against using force to interfere with the people's right to participate in popular movements. The people were sovereign, and so was their right to form popular movements, with or without the Senate's approval. And furthermore, the people's representatives, the tribunes of the plebs, were inviolable, yet that sacrosanctity did not protect Saturninus at the time of his murder. Cicero, who took the case hoping to avoid the reopening of old wounds, which would ultimately lead to renewed conflict between the Marian and Sullen factions, won the case for Rabirius. Cicero cited that such force was authorized under the Senatus Consultum Ultimum the Senate had invoked toward Gaius Marius. But, because Marius had not issued the death sentence against Saturninus, but rather impetuous conservative youths had taken the role of executioner upon themselves, and without any repercussions, Caesar had made his point. By mid-63 BC, Cicero, in his capacity as consul, was expected to oversee the election of his consular successes for the 62 BC year. We are told by some accounts that a woman named Fulvia, who was the mistress of a man wishing to warn Cicero, came to him with knowledge of a plot by Lucius Sergius Catalina to assassinate several people, including the consuls, on election day. During his speech on election day, Cicero, who had surrounded himself with bodyguards, openly wore body armor. In his speech, Cicero impressed on the crowd that the day a self-serving populist like Catalina, won the consulship, was the day that politicians who played by the rules would be in mortal danger. He likely reminded his audience that revolution always came on the heels of promises to cancel debt. And, since it was impossible to pass a complete cancellation of debt without at least some consul or tribune of the plebs vetoing the motion, Catalina obviously had some other form of government in mind. No assassination attempts were made on election day and, for the final time, Lucius Sergius Catalina, who had now bankrupted himself with his multiple attempts at the consulship, finished in third. Cicero's next trial in the courts was directly related to the consular elections for the 62 BC year. One of the losers of the consular election accused one of the winners of bribery and electoral fraud. He wanted the results of the consular election thrown out. To a man like Cicero, nothing would have been more destabilizing. Bribing people during elections, though highly illegal, was also very commonplace. Everyone did it, but it had to be done subtly quietly, and in the background. Even as Cicero campaigned against electoral bribery, his conservative backers were spreading bribe money behind the scenes in order to get him elected for the 63 BC year. 
Cicero argued that if Rome began throwing out election results over accusations of bribery, every future election would be followed by a court case initiated by the losers. The prosecution in this trial was led by Marcus Porcius Cato, and the trial got ugly. Cato ranted endlessly about how corruption had seeped into everyday Roman life. And though Cato's statement was true, Cicero responded by mockingly referring to Cato's philosophy as unrealistic and ridiculous. He argued that Rome, unlike Greece, got things done, even if it got a bit messy in the process. Cicero, again, won his case. Afterwards, as if to prove that he wasn't supportive of corruption and bribery, Cicero immediately legislated a new law which increased the punishment for blatant bribery to up to 10 years in exile. This was a way of warning all future candidates that, of late, the bribery had gotten so out of hand that electoral trials were becoming a yearly issue. With his legislation, Cicero let everyone know that it was time to reign in the blatant bribery.